What's up? This is a video I'm doing where I look at spooky horror movies for every day of October, starting whenever. Now. This is October 1st, by the way. Now, I know what you're thinking. This sucks. I don't want to see your face. Now, I know what you're thinking. This video seems very slapped together. And you'd be right. So I'm gonna watch and review a horror movie. So I'm gonna watch and review 31 horror movies. And this video will be called something like 31 films of fright. I don't know, some bullshit like that. And essentially, I am not a good on-screen presence. And I am learning that very quickly. But, I will do my best. The thing about these movies is that, starting from, like, the earliest horror movie, like, ever, which will be, um, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and then we're going up to the modern era. Look at this lens flare, isn't that something, hey? So I'm gonna watch The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and I will get back to this. And also, over the course of these 31 days, you will see my beard grow. And that will be something to behold, I'm sure. Anyway. Yeah. My hair looks cool, by the way. Fuck you. So, I watched The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I was actually going to buy this movie on Blu-ray. My Blu-ray collection's here. You know, I've got the Chris Tuckman type setup now. Um, but I decided against it because I got a 4K release, like, in Germany, and then I knew, like, you know, an English subtitled release was coming, and I was right. So, instead, uh, because it's not on any streaming service, because, you know, why would this movie that's, like, the first horror movie and it's, like, part of history or whatever be on a streaming service, you know? So instead I watched it on my phone, on YouTube, with all the YouTube compression. Oh my god! Yeah. And you know, I'm, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you didn't really watch the movie. Shut, shut up. Shut up. Stop. I know. I know. I know. But just putting that aside, I did really enjoy this movie, like, for what it is. It is, like, very of its time. It even breaks the 180 rule, I believe, at, like, one point. But, you know, that was probably before the 180 rule was even, like, established in, like, the language of cinema. So, you know, it gets a pass, I think, for that. It, it is very, like, stunning visually, and... I think it's very hard to review this movie because it's like a hundred years, it's, it's literally like a hundred and two years old. So, like, what what new can I even like say about it really? God, I hate how the phone camera makes me look. Oh my god, my proportions are like all off. <laughs> so yeah, this is a very like difficult m movie to re review, so I'm not really gonna like review it necessarily, but just like give my first impressions on it, which is that it's good. You, you see, like, why saying that about an 102-year-old movie is, like, kind of pointless? That's like saying, yeah, I think the Mona Lisa is good, you know? But anyway, I think what stood out the most was definitely, like, the sets, and, like, that's what, like, everyone just talks about. Like, it's all very, like... Everything's just, like, pointy and, like, a triangle, which I think, like, adds to, like, you know, feeling is surrounded by, like, danger and, like, when everything looks like a knife, basically. But yeah, it is a very, like, bold choice, especially at the time, I'm guessing. Like, I'm guessing, like, no other movie had, like, attempted to, like, do sets like that. And the thing about the sets is also, you can tell it's just like painted on like cardboard and stuff, but like it doesn't matter really. It doesn't like take away from the movie at all. It's just like, 
you just have to buy into that it's part of the environment, it's part of where the movie is set, and if you don't buy into that one, well then the movie just doesn't work for you, but like... But talking about the characters and the performances, the performances are obviously like very played up for the screen because, you know, it's a silent era, you had to convey to the audience like as much information as possible without them needing dialogue until they do need the dialogue in the cue cards of course in terms of the characters i think they definitely like have very unique looks caligari is like this cartoon character and so is cesare he's like a goth <laughs> basically you can you can tell it like influenced Tim Burton and how all his characters ended up looking. If I was to have like one complaint about the film, it's that I think the sets work in that it's from the perspective of the story that this man is telling th this other man. So it's sort of this fantasy type thing where maybe it's being like distorted in his memory. But then you get to the end of the movie, and they revisit one of those sets in real time, and that kind of breaks the illusion that, like, it was meant to be sort of exaggerated because it was within this, like, story within a story type thing. Also, I didn't like the music, which, you know, it's of its time, and do I even count the music with it because it was a silent movie? I mean, I guess I do, because, you know, it was part of how they presented the film, but the music is definitely very of its time and can get quite tedious. So, yeah, that's another complaint. But, yeah, I don't really have much else to say about it. Although it isn't scary by today's standards, of course, it is still a very interesting watch. It's not really worth, like, giving a rating to, I don't think, which... Sounds like a bad thing, but it's just like, how do you, how do you like give a rating to like a movie like that, you know? Um, but on Letterboxd, I gave it like four out of five stars, so I guess it's like an eight, maybe an eight and a half out of ten. Anyway, on to the Phantom Carriage. So, the Phantom Carriage. For this movie, I actually purchased a Criterion, um, which is very good, and... And in that it says it had a lot of influence on the films of Ingmar Bergman and what I didn't know going in was that uh, this movie is also like well known. I've seen a lot of gifts of it because it influenced the scene, the Here's Johnny scene in The Shining. In the film it's sort of a different context to how they're presenting it. But yeah, that should give you an indicator that this is a pretty heavy film. It's essentially a retelling of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, except it takes place on New Year's Eve for some reason, and instead of it being sort of like this dream, this guy instead dies at the start and goes to the afterlife, which sort of subverted my expectations because at the start they say that whoever rides a carriage is someone who dies on New Year's Eve, and you think it's going to be this sick woman who dies, but instead, it's this man who dies. Because, well, I'm not going to get too much into it. Uh, you can watch the full movie on YouTube, same for Dr. Caligari. Because, you know, they're very old movies and the rights have long expired. And I would highly recommend it. I really love this film. It's gorgeous and sad and just incredibly, like, powerful. The main actor and also director, Victor Jostrom, is just incredible. This is a pretty phenomenal performance, especially in the days of silent cinema. Like in Passion of Joan of Arc, he really plays to the strength of exaggerating these extreme emotions with his face. And it really does the job. You really buy that he is this man who is mean and resentful and also just incredibly like sad and ashamed of himself. The film is really carried by his performance and yeah it's just a really beautiful film. 
Um, it's not a horror. I don't know why it was like categorized as a horror on Letterboxd, but it's it's really not. There's no like scenes that are meant to like scare the audience, even like a 1920s audience. It's a drama with these sort of fantasy elements, um, but I'd still like highly recommend it to just anyone really. Although there are many audiences who definitely don't like silent films, I think it's still overall pretty accessible to audiences today and I'd highly recommend it to anyone. The directing of the film and just like how the camera is placed and how it's all cut together just feels like so ahead of its time and so modern. This is really the one to beat. I think this will be my favourite of the 31 films, which I know is pretty early to say that, but yeah. It's at least, I'd say like a 9.5 out of 10. It might even go up to a 10 like later on on repeat viewings. So the next two films we're going to talk about are Nosferatu and Haksan, or Hexen. From what I could find it's pronounced Hexen, which I think is where the term Witch's Hex comes from. But yeah, anyway, I saw this as a double feature at the Astor Cinema, and the Astor Cinema is, like, the best cinema in Melbourne, in my opinion. Um, they play a lot of old movies, and it's a really great place. They're not paying me to say this, I just really like that cinema. And, you know, I really want to talk about, like, how the audiences with me, like, reacted to the films. So first off, Nosferatu. Ah, uh, yeah, throughout the film... The audiences were laughing quite a lot, and it is an inherently goofy movie. It's a lot sillier than I thought it would be. There's a lot of humour that comes out of the dramatic irony of it, where basically the main character we follow, at least for the first half, is incredibly ignorant about vampires and superstition, and there's a lot of humour derived of that, and also in his like very exaggerated like just laughing at these things and just how much he just rejects them and yeah it is genuinely quite funny although a lot of reviews i've seen like on letterboxd praising the film talk about how oh my god it's so terrifying it must have terrified audiences at the time and maybe that was true for some of it but there's definitely like a lot of comedy derived from the film even with you know nosferatu himself Count Orlok, as they call him. I don't know if Nosferatu is, like, his name also. I, I don't know. But yeah, this is actually based pretty directly on the Dracula story. And I knew it was inspired, and they had to, like, change things because at the time Dracula was copyrighted, and they didn't have the rights to make a Dracula film, so they had to change names and stuff. But it is very much the same story, and having seen the 1992 Dracula film, which also adheres pretty closely to Bram Stoker's Dracula, while watching this, I was just like, I have seen this movie before. But there's a lot of beautiful shots, especially of like wide, open landscape shots. It's also very well known for the use of shadows, especially in one scene, and the look of Count Orlok himself, who is played by a man named Max Shrek, which I instantly recognized. Oh my god, that's Christopher Walken's character from Batman Returns. So yeah, that's another movie that very much influenced Tim Burton. But yeah, the look of Count Orlok was incredibly influential and is very memorable, especially with the long fingers and the way he walks and moves, it's all very striking. The audiences did laugh quite a lot at the effects in the film, and you can sort of defend it for the time, especially like how they did the fast motion, but the stop motion I don't think was very good even for the time, because there's also stop motion in the film Hexen, and it's a lot better in that film. There also isn't really a main character to connect to, and I think that brings it down a little bit for me. But yeah, it is still a very influential film, and I did quite like it, so I'm gonna give it a 7 out of 10. So the next film, Hexen. Uh, man, this is a wild-ass movie. 
I mean, for the time, it must have been, like, unimaginably, like, controversial. But even by today's standards, just, like, how it got reactions from the audience, it still has that same effect even now. So, I had no idea what this film was. I've, I've seen, like, a few images from the film. I've heard good things. Um, I considered buying it, but when the, I found out about the screening, I just started, decided to go. But now that I've seen the film, I, I loved it. it. It's insane, and I have to earn it. I have to buy the Criterion now. So when this film opened... I was like, oh my god, it's a documentary for some reason, which, yeah, it is partly, but we'll get into that. And it talks about the universe and how God is above all. And I was like, oh god, this is going to be a, no pun intended, this is going to be a very religious sort of propaganda film, which I'm sure was pretty normal at the time. But then it started getting into these, like, historical recreations of witches or women accused of witchery and how they were then tortured and forced to then admit to these crimes of witchery that they didn't even commit and there's a great scene where this woman is just talking about how she did all this with the devil and all this and there was an orgy and stuff and she's just telling it to these monks who had tortured her and she's just going on and on and on and then it cuts back to this shot of the monks and they just all have this dumbfounded look on their face and that got like such a huge laugh from the audience and I was just stunned that that kind of joke which we see a lot in movies now where a character tells a story and we see the story take place and then we see the other characters reaction to that story that kind of comedic bit that we see in so many movies and TV was done in this film and it must have originated in this film like unless there was some other film that did it it felt like so modern and it was so well done and yeah this film is very like funny there's a lot of like very dry humor and the director is also um, speaking to the audience and is talking about all these things and sort of making jokes as well so it is very much intentionally funny but at the same time there's also some pretty creepy imagery the look of like all the demons and the devils it is very creepy but also in the right parts it is also funny like how the devil moves and like some of the things he does it's it is visually just like so memorable the devil just has such a presence in this film that is like both sort of creepy and funny and every scene like that is just immediately like the audience is so just into it and you could just tell that as this film went on the audiences i think many of the audiences i saw this with hadn't seen that film were just getting more and more into it i think at the start where presented itself as a documentary, there were some audiences who were kind of a bit confused and sort of bored. But then as it went on and just had all these like crazy scenes, the audience just got so into it. And it was such a great theater experience. And also, it made me think about how this film, a lot of the themes of like, you know, witchcraft and also the abuse of women at that time, that had a lot of influence on uh, Robert Eggers' The Witch. And according to the English subtitles, at least, Hexen translates to The Witch. So yeah, I'm sure this film had a lot of influence on Robert Eggers. And I know that Nosferatu did as well, so... <laughs> I'm sure Robert Eggers is kicking himself they didn't fly over to Melbourne to go to that screening. But um, anyway... And this film is very, like, progressive and thought-provoking, especially for the time. It had this message of, like, how religion boxes people in and makes them believe things and makes them think they see things and how that's used to, like, abuse people, abuse women especially, and abuse the mentally ill. 
and at the time to have this film that is so critical of uh, Christianity in modern times and the church, it is insane to me that this got released even. I'm sure this was very controversial at the time and it would still be quite controversial now. We also see um, some torture devices and that made some audiences squirm. So this film still shocks today. And it also has this very sympathetic message towards mentally ill and how they are treated, especially at the time. And it talks about how even in 1922, and this movie is a hundred years old, how people are so brainwashed essentially by religion and how crazy that is to still happen in modern times. And that just got so much laughter from the audience because it's still so relevant now. So yeah, this was a pretty insane movie and yeah, I quite loved it. Um, German Expressionism Horror, you're good, but man, Sweden was on a whole nother level. And also I didn't talk about this with the Phantom Carriage, but the Swedish words for the end is just slut. And it says it at the end of this film, and of course that got a laughter out of the audience as well. Although that was the only part where the audience was laughing at something that was unintentionally funny. But the rest of it had the exact effect on the audience that I'm sure the director intended. So if you ever in your life get a chance to see this in cinemas, I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, the only complaint I would have is that some scenes go on a bit long and might be a bit repetitive. But that's really it. I'm giving this film a 9 out of 10. It is pretty phenomenal and I think any fan of horror or just anyone who thinks this is interesting based on what I said, uh, definitely go seek this out. You can watch it on YouTube or, you know, buy it if you want. So next up is Faust and I actually ended up watching this after the Night of the Living Dead, so this is like recorded like much later, but going in earlier, uh, because I had to wait for the Blu-ray to arrive. Um, so about what I just said about German Expressionism, um, I take it back because this movie slaps. This is from director F.W. Murnau, and I feel like this deserves to be the film that he's most well known for. At least, more than Nosferatu. And, you know, I still like Nosferatu, but it definitely has its flaws. This, though, really impressed me, and he really stepped up his game a lot in this. Part of that, I imagine, was the budget increase. You could tell this was a very expensive production, especially for the time, I imagine. I guess at this point, black and white movies didn't have the yellow and blue filters on them, which is good, because this looks a lot better for it. And holy shit, the look of this movie. There are so many scenes in this that just look nothing like anything I've ever seen before from the 20s, or in any movie really. It recreates this feel of religious renaissance art really flawlessly, especially in that opening. The special effects are breathtaking even by today's standards. I'm sort of just left stunned, like what, how, how did they do that? The story in this actually reminded me a lot of Aladdin, except instead of a genie, the guy makes a deal with the devil, and then tries to use this newfound power to impress this woman he loves. And again, and I'll continue to say this a lot, but this is not a horror movie. There is one scene that is quite creepy, but it's not a horror. It's a fancy romance fairy tale. It's much more in line with, like I said, Aladdin. And, like in Aladdin, the one who steals the show here is the wish-granting character, who in this is Devil, who is such a troublemaking little piece of shit. I loved him so much. He provides some great comic relief. I was also surprisingly invested in the characters in the romance, a lot more than Nosferatu, this is just a very well done, compelling, spectacle movie, and I definitely made the right move in buying it. My only complaint is that some parts go on for a little too long, like in Hexen, but really that's it. This is a really great film, and I think I'll give it a 9.5 out of 10. 
I think I liked the Phantom Carriage a little bit more, but this is a very close second. So the next movie is The Man Who Laughs. Uh, I decided to watch this movie because I'm sure a lot of people know this, but The Man Who Laughs, the look of that character was what inspired the Joker. Yeah, I had to watch this on my phone as well. Couldn't find it on YouTube. Um, I would assume it's out of copyright, but I don't know, I just couldn't find it. So I might have watched it illegally. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. Uh, this is an American film, but from a German expressionist director. So there's a lot of striking visuals. I don't have a lot to say about this movie, to be honest. I thought it was uh, pretty damn good, but I just couldn't get into the story. It's incredibly well made and like well directed in like how it's shot, especially like for the time. I think the opening especially. A lot of the shots in that opening look like they're out of like a uh, painting, like a romanticized type renaissance painting. It's really impressive. But yeah, the way it's shot, the way the story is structured, it all feels incredibly modern and you can see, like, compared to films like Nosferatu and Caligari, how film has evolved since then into something more recognizable by today's standards. Also, and I say this a lot, but it's not a horror. I'm sorry I keep having to say this. But yeah, it's a character drama. Unfortunately, I just didn't find the main character, Gwynplaine, uh, to be very interesting. He's a very passive character. He doesn't really do a whole lot, except just wallow in, like, misery the whole movie. Even though, you know, he has, like, two women in the film who are both in love with him. And I just don't find his in a conflict very interesting or believable that someone like that would just hate himself but whatever to be honest and this is going to sound cruel maybe but i think as a character he should have suffered more have it so he struggles to find anyone who loves him really you know similar to how the elephant man in a way and all the other characters as well i wasn't really too invested in. It is incredibly well made, especially for the time and well directed, but yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about it. I'd still give it like a 7 out of 10, even though I wasn't too invested in it. Alright, now for this one, we're talking about talkies. So again, I went to the Asta and I saw a triple feature. This was Frankenstein, Dracula, and Creature from the Black Lagoon, some classic Universal Monsters movies. They played Frankenstein first, but Dracula actually came out before Frankenstein, so I'll talk about Dracula. So in Dracula, they actually um, call him Nosferatu at a few points, which I know Nosferatu I think means vampire in Romanian, but I'm gonna have to assume that was a nod to the Nosferatu movie. I mean, why else would they say it, really? Also, there's a vampire bee in the movie with a little vampire coffin at the start. And that was just, like, a really funny joke, but <laughs> the rest of the movie doesn't really have jokes. And there's a lot of great matte paintings at the start, and a lot of great, like, gothic sets. The performance of Dracula is, of course, iconic. But again, I didn't really find myself too invested in the characters. And it's a shame, because I do like the Bram Stoker's Dracula story. I haven't read it, but I've, from what I've gathered from all the other movies I've seen, I think it is a really cool story, and I think it does lend itself pretty well to a film. But here, I don't think there was enough time to develop a lot of the characters. I will admit, though, I think some of it is let down by the audience reaction, because the audience was laughing quite a lot, because it is a cheesy movie it's from 1931 so of course it is and i think acting at that point it was sort of hard for actors to adjust to talking and having their audio recorded and i think a lot of it 
sort of bleeds in from the sort of over-the-top acting you see in silent films, but it doesn't really translate that well. Once audio is introduced, acting needed to become a lot more subtle, and I think at this point at least, it wasn't quite there. But yeah, it looks beautiful, it's well directed, a lot of it is very iconic, and I'll give it a 7 out of 10. I did like it slightly more than The Man Who Laughs, but yeah. Anyway, next up, Frankenstein. Again, this movie is very similar to Dracula in that it looks beautiful, it's very well directed, it is very cheesy and dated, which is to be expected, but you really get a sense of that with how much the audience was just laughing, which I suppose is quite unfortunate, but you know, audiences have just adjusted to completely different films at this point. I think this one is done with more of a wink and a nod though, because at the start it has a guy come in and give a warning for how scary the movie is going to be, and it is sort of intentionally quite uh, corny and cheesy. Uh, for this adaptation they actually changed Victor Frankenstein's name to Henry Frankenstein, but there is also a character named Victor who is not a Frankenstein. So that's kind of weird and confusing, and I don't know why they did that. There's also a bunch of other stuff they changed, which, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of YouTube videos and essays talking about how much they changed from the novel, but I think a lot of the changes actually helped to adapt it to the big screen. I think Frankenstein's monster is very, like, obviously looks iconic, and Boris Karloff gives a really good physical performance. There's the scene where he kills a little girl, and I noticed that the film was actually a lot more degraded in that scene, so I'm guessing maybe the original camera negatives of that scene have been lost and they had to get like some kind of backup copy or a copy that was sent out to movie theaters or something to restore it. So that's quite interesting, because I know that scene was very, very controversial when it came out in cinemas. Unfortunately, I just wasn't very interested in Henry Frankenstein getting married and all those things, which isn't a huge part of the movie, and I think they managed to make it interesting by putting Frankenstein's monster into the mix. And I also think the ending was quite abrupt. Well, I guess at that point, movie endings, you know, they weren't as tight as they are nowadays. You don't get that sort of epilogue scene that you do in movies now. But yeah, it is very entertaining, and it looks beautiful, and it's iconic and very hard to review. Uh, but I'll give it a 7.5 out of 10. It might go up on rewatch, same for Dracula, but I don't know. Alright, next up, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, I know this movie is a classic, but I didn't really like it that much. There are definitely some good things about it. I think the creature himself, or the gill man as some call him, uh, is definitely the best part of this movie. I think the suit is, you know, it's very dated by today's standards, and in a lot of shots it just plain doesn't look good. But in some shots, I think where it's more hidden, it is pretty good looking. And I think it is very impressive considering how the actor inside it had to wear it underwater and swim underwater. I think that's all, like, very impressive that they were able to do that in, like, 1954. And the filming underwater as well is just very impressive. The creature's roar as well, that was, like, a huge standout. That sounded like, you know, the kind of roars you hear in modern movies and movies like Jurassic Park, and I'm sure it influenced, like, how the roars of like the T-Rex and stuff sounded in that movie. So that was definitely very like influential and sounded like a lot better than I thought it would. Unfortunately though, I just found it very slow and repetitive and I was not interested in the characters at all. I think if you want a good Creature from the Black Lagoon movie, watch The Shape of Water. I'm giving this one a 5 out of 10. So, next up is 1954's Godzilla. Got the Godzilla shirt here, so let's go. So, for this, I obviously watched the Japanese version, 
not the Americanized version that also came out the same year, where they added footage of an American person. Uh, and for this movie, I actually bought quite a while ago, actually, uh, this big Criterion here. Um, and yeah, it was a blind buy, which is pretty bold for this sort of thing. But I do like Godzilla, like just the concept of Godzilla and all the other movies I've seen them in, especially Shin Godzilla. And I was surprised how much this movie reminded me of Shin Godzilla. I mean, Shin Godzilla really is the modernized remake. It really is a remake of this movie. And yeah, I actually really love both of those movies. Um, I was surprised how much I ended up enjoying this. This is a really masterfully directed movie. There's a lot of great music. And it can also be enjoyed like just as a monster movie, which I'm sure many Americans did while just not getting the message. It deals with the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it's a pretty deeply like anti-war movie. And like in Shin Godzilla, there's a lot of discussions around normal people and people in government, and just a bunch of people about like what to do about Godzilla, like should Godzilla be killed, how do we kill Godzilla, and just dealing with this destruction and the aftermath of what has happened. And I found it all really interesting, and I was really invested in the characters. I think the use of music is really great here, and the score is just really beautiful. There's obviously the Godzilla theme, which I'm sure you've all heard, but there's also a bunch of other music as well that is just really, like, beautiful, and sad, and melancholic. But Godzilla himself and the effects is, you know, the driving force of this movie, and Godzilla is obviously very memorable, he's got a very, like, unique, memorable design, a very unique roar as well, and, you know, what I said about the Creature of the Black Lagoon roar, it's sort of the opposite here, where, again, it's a great roar, but it's unlike any other monster roar you've heard in, like, any other movies, and it belongs solely to Godzilla. I think the effects are, you know, they're quite dated, but for the time, it's really impressive, like, how they were able to do all these miniatures, and then just have a guy in a suit stomp on him, which definitely, like, it, it, it's dated, but it has a certain charm to it, which makes me go a lot easier on it. I think, although I did like the characters, I think it should have used a little bit more character work, and I am confused why, and if you've seen the film you know what I'm talking about, but there's this character who builds this weapon called the Oxygen Destroyer, which, spoiler alert, is used to kill Godzilla, but they, they bring him back. You know they bring him back. They made a billion sequels to this. They don't bring him back in this movie though, he's pretty completely dead. But in the movie there's this huge debate on whether or not the Oxygen Destroyer should be used and this guy sort of has, you know, like an Oppenheimer type conflict. But I'm sort of puzzled why he did build the Oxygen Destroyer in the first place, if he didn't want to do anything with it. He said he was going to find some way to use it for the good of humanity, but he couldn't think of anything to use it for, and even when it came to using it to kill Godzilla, he was still iffy on that. So, I'm not sure why that was. Like, if that's not for the good of humanity, then I don't know what is. So yeah, I think that part of the film is a little bit messy. But, aside from that, this is a really, like, entertaining and beautiful movie. And it's, it's just great. So, I'm gonna give it a 9 out of 10. I'm really glad I loved it. It means I didn't waste my money on that huge criterion. So, the next one I'm going to talk about is Onibaba, which is a 1964 Japanese film. Actually brought the criterion for this. Um, not a very good transfer for some reason. Uh, I don't think it was like transferred in like 4K or 2K. I think it was much uh, lower res than that, but whatever. I'm sure Criterion did the best they could. Uh, so this movie is more of an erotic thriller than it is a horror movie. I know I keep saying that, oh, this isn't really a horror movie, but 
not. It is at the end though, and I'll get to that. But um, it's about these two women, um, one an older woman, and then a man comes and sort of romance and, you know, things ensue. It reminded me a lot of um, The Lighthouse in a lot of ways, and The Lighthouse is like this movie, but like, it's um, the more masculine view on the subject matter rather than a feminine view, and it is more sort of stripped down in some ways because of how there are only two characters, and that it stays that way the entire film. But yeah, in that it feels very modern, especially in how it's shot. The black and white is used so beautifully here. In movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, for example, it didn't really utilize the black and white very well. While this movie has like extremely dynamic lighting, and it utilizes that so well, it's really like beautiful to look at. It's probably the best looking movie that I've talked about so far. And in it there are themes of like sexual desire and oppression and sort of this older generation being in many ways jealous of the younger generation and trying to punish younger generations just because of how jealous they are and it's all really great. I've also seen some interpretations saying it is a very like anti-war movie as a response to World War II, which in some ways it might be, but I didn't really get that. But maybe if I watch it again with that lens, I will get that. And I just find it really cool how a lot of people find very different interpretations in movies like this. The only real horror elements in the film is the mask, in which there's some supernatural stuff there, but that's really it, and that doesn't really come into play until... I'd say like two thirds into the film. And it's just like so much symbolism in the film. There's like this big pit that's sort of, it's sort of like, you know, the lighthouse in the lighthouse where you can interpret a lot of different things from it. Although I think it's pretty clear metaphor for death. But there's also, um, I'm gonna sound very immature here, but there is storytelling through boobies. And what I mean by that is that whenever the female characters are shown as being horny, even if it's not explicitly said or explicitly shown in any way, they usually show the characters, like, you know, have their breasts out. Um, and, you know, when they're not horny, then their breasts are covered. And I, I thought that was really just well done and really subtle. And... You know, I guess maybe I caught on to that because I'm a dude. But whatever. It's it's storytelling through boobies. Boobies. That's that's cinema. That's movie magic right there. Anyway. <laughs> oh god. But yeah, this is an incredibly well-made movie. As far as complaints go. Um, the only real thing I have to say is that I think the music is quite cheesy and dated, and you can say that's an unfair criticism, but after hearing the music in Godzilla and how beautiful that was and how well that was utilized, I think it's pretty fair to say, compared to Godzilla for example, the music in this is not up to that level. But it's still such a great movie, and the presentation of it with the directing and the camera work makes it feel not dated at all. So I'm gonna give it a 9 out of 10. So the next film I watched was Rosemary's Baby. I uh, watched it on a streaming service. I didn't pay for it because, you know, it's directed by Roman Polanski. And uh, this is actually my first Polanski movie. Haven't seen Chinatown. And although I will be praising this movie, I want to be clear that I think Polanski is a detestable garbage excuse for a human being who deserves to be in prison. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google it. I'm not talking about it here on my YouTube channel. But yeah, this is a really great movie and it's the first film on here that is genuinely really creepy 
and disturbing and just plain scary, really. It does a great job at like presenting this view of this upper-class suburban America with this undercurrent of something sinister going on, sort of like the way David Lynch does. And throughout the film, Rosemary's being gaslit by everyone except her close friends. It's a really good movie about like, you know, the dangers of gaslighting and gender roles at the time, and what it was just like for women and what it still is like for women in many respects. Which is just like such a weird thing to say about a movie directed by someone like Roman Polanski. And the gaslighting of Rosemary, played brilliantly by Mia Farrow, is just so upsetting to watch. And she's just forced into this position of like having this baby. And it is a lot of times very sort of visceral because of her performance and just deeply upsetting and hard to watch. And there's also a part in the movie where, and um, trigger warning for like sexual assault, um, the husband just mentions sort of offhandedly that he sexually assaulted Rosemary while she was asleep and it's sort of like brushed off as like no big deal. Everyone's like, oh my god, that's like so awful. Like what wives were like subjected to and what was considered normal back in like the 50s and 60s. The film is so good at creating a sense of tension and pure horror and it is so like expertly well written. It has such a great script. The only complaint I would have is that some of the music is quite cheesy and dated, although a lot of it is genuinely quite creepy as well. So I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. You should have seen the baby though, right? I mean, come on. Baby and devil makeup. Man, that would have been so awesome. So next up, Night of the Living Dead. I didn't end up buying this because Criterion is actually putting out a 4K. It would be out by now, but it wouldn't have been able to get here in time. So I just figured I'd wait for that and then buy it. So I instead tried watching this on Amazon Prime, but uh, there was a uh, issue. They they colorized it, bro. Look at this. Look look at the car. Look how it like changes color. Why did they do this? Why what what? So I watched it on YouTube instead. And what I didn't know is that the reason it's available on YouTube is someone forgot to add the copyright logo in the film, and because of the laws at the time, the movie just became public domain. And it's crazy to think that had that not happened, George Romero would basically be the sole owner of zombies as we know them today. This was really the creation of the modern zombie, and all the tropes that came along with zombie movies. The zombies in this rise from the dead, feast on flesh, they infect others by biting them, and can only be killed by killing the brain or burning the body, which, as far as I know, all originated in this movie, and is just what zombies are in today's culture. The zombies in this do pick up things and use them as weapons, which surprisingly hasn't been utilized much in zombie movies or shows, which is kind of surprising. They're a little bit more smart in this, where they're able to pick up things and like stab people and whatever, which I think actually raises the stakes. But the tropes of the genre too, you get a bunch of misfit characters stuck in one location with limited amounts of weaponry. Some of them bond, some of them become enemies, some of them end up killing each other, there's usually a kid, and they usually end up getting picked off one by one. Sort of a spoiler, but you know how these movies kind of go. It's crazy to think how much this movie started, which is just ingrained in culture now, and this movie is only 54 years old. So yeah, this was a pretty damn great movie, and it's no wonder it inspired its own subgenre. It's surprisingly gory and grotesque as well, especially for the time, and I imagine this is what helped pave the way for the Grindhouse subgenre too. One thing I heard about this going in was about the social commentary, and it was surprisingly a lot more subtle than I thought it would be. 
the main hero of the movie is this black man, Ben, but not once do any of the characters explicitly come across as racist, but at the same time, you can tell that there are some characters who probably are racist, but just don't say it to his face. But it's never called attention to. Well, not until the ending that is, which I won't spoil, although it's a pretty famous movie ending. But anyway, that really helps drive home that yes, Romero was drawing attention to race in this movie. The guy who plays Ben also is by far the best actor in the movie. I think a lot of the acting in this is very cheesy, but that's my only real complaint with this, even if it is kinda major. But I'm willing to cut it some slack because it was a very low budget movie and they probably couldn't afford the best actors out there. I'm gonna give it an 8 out of 10, which might seem a little bit low compared to all the 9s I've been giving out recently, but trust me, anything that's 8 and above means I think it's great. And who knows, the score might go up a bit on rewatch. I'm definitely gonna have to cop that criterion. So the next film I'm gonna talk about is Deep Red, directed by Dario Argento. And for this I actually got the And for this I actually got the Blu-ray. I got it a while ago actually. Um like a few years ago and just hadn't gotten around to it. I think I'm definitely gonna have to upgrade to the 4K. I've only seen two films by Dario Argento, those being Suspiria and The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. And both of which I really like, especially Suspiria. For those who don't know, this is a Giallo film, and essentially what Giallo films are. It was essentially the Italian precursor to slasher films. And they all followed a similar structure where basically there's a killer dressed in black, who's killing people, and it's sort of a mystery of who they are, and then at the end, it's revealed. So for this, I actually watched the director's cut. There was a version on the Blu-ray where you could watch it partly in English, because the theatrical cut in America was done in English, and that was how most of it was shot, because it was shot with, like, American actors, speaking English and then was dubbed into Italian. So there's no actual extended cut that is in English, even though it was shot in English. It's it's weird, it was how Italians made movies, it's whatever. But it gave me a good insight of what was actually cut out of the film, because whenever they started speaking Italian, at that point you'd know, like, okay, this is a scene from the director's cut. So, I had a pretty great experience just watching this movie because I love that feeling of watching a movie and realizing at a certain point that you just love this movie. It just completely clicks with you, and that's what I got from this. This is by far my favorite Dario Argento film, at least from what I've seen, and it's my favorite film so far of all these horror movies that I'm talking about. First off, it looks great, there's a lot of great use of camera movements, it's very precisely directed, and the editing too, it really helps with the atmosphere and building suspense. It's got a great story, it's just a very cleverly written mystery film. If I have any complaints about Argento's other films, it would be the writing, but I think the writing really excels here. It's also really funny. There are a few dated jokes here and there, but most of them really hit. The part that stands out the most though is the score by Goblin, a band that went on to frequently work with Argento. But yeah, the score in this just slaps. It really adds to the manic energy of the film, and it just wouldn't be the same without it. As far as complaints go, I think it ends rather abruptly, but that's basically it. I really, really enjoyed this, and I can see myself revisiting this a lot in the future. For now, I'm gonna give it a 9.5 out of 10. So, next up is Eraserhead, directed by David Lynch. For this, I actually bought the Criterion, and despite me not seeing what might be his most popular movie up until now, I've seen a decent amount from David Lynch, including The Elephant Man, Dune, Wild at Heart, Mulholland Drive, and all of Twin Peaks. With the movie Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me being my favorite out of everything he's done, I love that movie. 
As for a race ahead, I definitely loved a lot of this. The visuals were pretty phenomenal for the time, especially considering the small budget. The puppetry of the baby looked incredible, and the general story and themes, I think, come across here in a way that feel a lot more clear compared to a lot of Lynch's other works. Not to say that instantly makes it better or worse. I think what makes Lynch so popular and so profound as a filmmaker is that his movies are so interpretable. In this, the themes of fatherhood and this man not feeling ready to settle are immediately apparent. And maybe it was because it didn't leave as much to interpret that I didn't end up connecting to this as much as a lot of other Lynch movies. There's still some stuff, like I think this takes place in a post-nuclear apocalypse, and there's plenty to interpret from the Lady in the Radiator as well, which I interpreted as the main character Henry trying to use media like television as a form of escapism. But I've also seen other interpretations saying that the Lady in the Radiator represents lust or represents Henry wanting to commit suicide, so there's definitely a lot to interpret there. Oh, and I almost didn't mention, but this isn't a horror movie. Take a shot, but no, seriously, this is kinda horror adjacent, but it's not a horror movie. Barely any of it felt like it was trying to scare me. Really, this is just a drama presented through a really surrealist lens. But yeah, I still thought this was really great, don't get me wrong, and I'll be revisiting a lot in the future for sure. For now, I'm gonna give this an 8 out of 10. So next up is Dawn of the Dead, and for this I bought the Collector's Edition 4K. Um, bit of a risky choice of a blind buy there, but whatever. I have seen the Zack Snyder remake, which I maintain is very good, I really enjoy that movie. So for this I watched the extended Cannes cut, which I thought was George Romero's definitive director's cut, but it isn't. I found out after that Romero considers the US theatrical version to be his definitive cut of the film, so maybe I should have watched that version. I will say I did think this was a bit too long, but hey, it's not like I can really hold that against this movie, since that's really a problem with the extended cuts, and the extended cut isn't meant to be viewed as the definitive version of the film. But, you know, that's the kind of problem where you run into with different cuts and different versions of movies. So, this film is essentially a bigger budget version of Night of the Living Dead. It really does feel almost like a spiritual remake in a sense, if that's even a thing. It follows the same structure, except this time they're in a mall. And this time the political angle is Romero's criticism of consumerism. But also at the same time, the characters also indulge that they get to stay in this mall and they get to have all these products to themselves. So it's a pretty damn clever concept. It's sort of like this cynical wish fulfillment type scenario, except while the characters get to indulge in all these things, the world's also ended and everyone these people know and care about have probably died. There's again a lot of gore. I think the zombie makeup in this looks a bit cheap though, but the gore makeup is pretty good. The music is really good, which is no surprise considering it's scored by Goblin and Dario Argento. As far as my issues with the film go, I think the plot slows down at points where it kind of struggles to find somewhere to go. It's definitely not as tired as Night of the Living Dead, which was just 90 minutes, while this is over 2 hours. I also think some of the sound mix was quite bad, where some of the sound effects were overpowering the dialogue, I couldn't hear what was being said. Some of that was certainly intentional, but some of it was just kind of annoying. Still, this is just another really great zombie movie, and I think it stands alongside Night of the Living Dead as a worthy successor, which is why I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. So, unfortunately I'm going to have to end this video here, but I will talk about the remaining 15 movies in an upcoming video, which I'll try to get out as soon as possible. What I realized, unfortunately, is that I'm giving reviews that are about 2 to 5 minutes long on 31 movies. So, this will likely end up being at least, like, nearly 2 hours long, and 
I just don't want to upload that long of a video for a myriad of reasons. First of all, I think it would fry my laptop, and second, I just don't know if anyone would watch a video that long. So instead, I'm gonna upload this in two parts, I'm gonna let this video sit for a little while, and upload part two pretty soon. I'm committed to it at this point, so even if this video does horribly views-wise, I'm still gonna upload a part two. If I do this again next year, I'm just gonna upload two to five minute long reviews of the movies every day of October, instead of trying to compile it all in one video at the end of October. Ah, <sighs> man, I really did not think this through, huh? Continued in part two.